So we did the review of the ASRock N1000, which was an inexpensive, like hundred-ish dollar N100 desktop board, using that for coloring outside the lines purposes, like a home server or a forbidden router, as I did. And then there's this, the board with no name. This was an order on AliExpress. It literally is the board with no name. There's there's a mobile Ryzen CPU on here, and I guess that's a you know a Game of Thrones meme, and those aren't popular anymore. I don't. We're already off to a terrible start. Terrible start. Okay, so check this thing out. My configuration is an 8845HS. The CPU's vary a little bit. It's an 8-core 16-thread Zen 4 CPU, 5.1 gigahertz max boost, two DDR5, so dim slots, an X16 physical, we'll take a look at the electrical in just a minute, uh, PCI Express slot nine SATA ports, eight of which are through two high density SFF connectors, and then plus one other SATA, which could be used for a you know, disk on module or boot drive, whatever, two 2280 M.2 and ATX power, relatively low power. I mean, it's a CTDP of 54 watts. And check out the port layout. Four i225V, two and a half gig NICs, 40 gig USB 4, DisplayPort and HDMI out, and then you've got a bunch more 5 10 gigabit USB. This is a weird little board, but I love it. It's also really weird because it comes with this built-in copper shim, which is basically just a mechanical adapter to Intel style square cooling. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, standard CR2032 lithium battery, no Type-C connection for the front panel or anything like that. We do have two onboard USB 2 headers as well as two more USB 2 breakout headers. So you could get a total of six USB 2.0 ports on this if you really wanted to. And a single 3.5mm audio out, which appears to be TRS, so that could be good for a stereo connection. This might be the ideal platform for a powerful home router slash home firewall with stateful packet inspection slash this thing is maximum overkill because it's eight cores, 16 threads. Like the Firebat T8, I think is really popular on the forum because you could do some really creative stuff with it and because it's $150. But with this, because you've got the eight onboard SATA ports, you could sort of eschew having an add-in LSI controller for disks if you're happy with up to eight disks. So that saves about $100. So, you know, $150 plus another $100 for your, your SAS controller or your, your SAS HBA. It's like $250, and then you go like another $100 is $350, and then, okay. So, this is a, about a four to $500 thing in the bare bones configuration. It's a little higher end, but that 5.1 gigahertz single thread clock speed is like having at least 16 efficiency cores. I mean, that's going all the way up to like an N305 and then doubling it and then adding a little bit more on top of that in terms of horsepower. Do you need that much horsepower in a home server? Mostly no. And if you're gonna run ZFS, you also really don't need that much horsepower, but it does let you run smaller blocks on ZFS because the smaller the blocks, the higher the overhead, but the smaller the blocks, the higher, the better random performance, the better performance of virtual machines that are running on a ZFS pool, et cetera, et cetera. Also the dual 2280, one on the top of the board, one on the back of the board, could be good if you're gonna rock something like an Optane for cash, but those are 22110. So you'd have to get creative about mounting it. You could also do a breakout cable where you go from a 2280 into a U.2 connection. Those cables are still pretty easy to get. And of course you've got an expansion slot. So we'll be doing exotic things. Like I've got my Mellanox Connect X5 here, which is dual 25 gig. And so like in this configuration, we've got four two and a half gig plus dual 25 gig. And this will rock your world in terms of building a stateful packet inspection firewall thing that will run at wire speed two and a half gig. Plus you've got the modern Zen four cores. So you can get all that VPN acceleration, all that wonderful, delicious wire guard or uh, open VPN to packet acceleration goodness. There's a couple of things I don't like about this board. One is that the VRM area, there's no cooling or heatsink or anything. But again, CTDP max on this chip is 54 watts and there is kind of a lot of VRM. It's a three plus two plus one-ish, basically. I mean, not exactly, but this is a mobile chip, so things get a little fuzzy. Uh, 
even a 54 watts, as long as there's some cooling, you're basically fine. It also has a hardware TPM header and a physical RS-232 header. So if you need a hardware serial port, you can do that. This is, of course, standard ITX form factor. So you could shove this in basically whatever you want as far as ITX form factors go. There's really a lot to like about this little board. In the box, you just get the board and an IO shield. And as far as like warranty, BIOS updates, any of that, basically none of that. So when you consider that $500, seems like a lot, but eight fast Zen four cores, plus everything, plus everything else. You really don't get tremendously better support from some of the other boards. Listen, if level one ever gets large enough that we can do group buys of these where we're buying like 100 or 200 of these at a time, I will sell them and support them on the level one tech store and then maybe we get a little bit better BIOS updates and a little bit better everything else because, hey, maybe we can, you know, get access to the BIOS tools and just build our own BIOSes and do the unlocks and do everything else. So let's put a little system together and take it for a spin, see what we're, see what we're up against. So I want to test this on Proxmox. I want to test this as a standalone Linux operating system. I want to test this with router top. Maybe is this good for free BSD? Spoiler alert, no. Because Zen 4. But you can run it in a forbidden router virtual machine, and then that works fine. Proxmox running OpenSense or PFSense, it's an option. One thing I really like about this board is that it has an absolutely ridiculous number of LEDs at the corner to give you status. Like a lot, more than any other board you've ever seen. The BIOS appears to be fully unlocked as well, so you can really get in there and tweak and tune. It's the Aptio setup, AMI. It's sort of a blue screen. They haven't really done any customization. This is basically, you know, sort of bog standard for what you get when you initially start customizing something. As you can see here, we've got our 8845HS with the Radeon 780M graphics. Now the Radeon 780M graphics, we actually can leverage those hardware encoder decoders in Linux. They're not quite as well supported as Quick Sync or anything like that, but the amount of progress that has been made on the software side the last couple of years is really incredible. So it is possible to use those for hardware acceleration with things like Plex Media Server and Jellyfin, but you do have a couple of hoops that you have to jump through in order to do that. They also work really well with OBS, Open Broadcaster. This platform is configured with a TJ Maxx of 90 degrees C, that is overridable in the BIOS. It also supports eco mode. In eco mode, it's going to lower the power that the system uses. You can also fine grain control that with TDC and EDC control here in the BIOS. But, all right, so the power specs for this thing are very, very impressive. Out of the box, from the wall, with my 80 plus gold power supply, we're talking like 65, 70 watts before we start adding anything. A neat trick for testing that, booting off of the network. But still, it is extremely low power. It doesn't have out-of-band management or anything like that, so there you go. The BIOS does give you smart fan control of both of your four-pin fan headers. That's CPU fan and system fan. So you can control the fan to be whatever you want. It supports above 4G decoding, resized bar support, SRIOV, BME, BME DMA mitigation, and hot plug support. One thing this BIOS does not seem to have support for is PCIe slot bifurcation. I was in a little bit of a hurry for this video, so if I didn't get that right, look for a pinned comment below. Sometimes there's a BIOS update that'll unlock that as well, so if that happens again, look for a pinned comment below. But as of right now, with the 2.22.1292 BIOS, bifurcation is not going to be an option. So you're not going to be able to take that PCIe slot and split it up into, you know, groups of four or eight lane devices. It's just, it is what you get. A single PCIe slot. If you really get your back up against a wall, you can turn those M.2 into a PCIe slot that's four lanes, but I don't know if I recommend it. This platform also supports AMD's RAID mode on your 22280 M.2, but I don't recommend that. Especially if you're gonna run Linux, just run Linux MD. You don't need you, you don't need AMD's RAID. It's fine, I promise. I also tested with add-in cards. This is our small form factor, factor ADA 4000. It shows up like you'd expect. It works perfectly with its 20 gigs of VRAM. Our Mellanox Connect X5 was detected and worked correctly. Again, very nice. The IOMMU breakdown on this board is also very nice. Each of the 226V NICs is in its own IOMMU group, as well as our storage, as well as pretty much everything else. It has two Asmedia SATA controllers on board, as well as what's built into the system on chip. So, ah, uh, you know, nine SATA ports 
What do you want? I mean, that's fine. It's totally fine. And you can kind of see the breakdown of the other PCI Express peripherals that are that are in the system on board, other than you know the, the, the small form factor ADA that's that's in the PCIe slot. Performance wise, this thing runs like a bat out of heck. It basically is the highest performance tier of this mobile processor. It feels like a desktop. It's basically identical performance to what we've gotten from many PCs, like Mini's Forum and everything else. I recently reviewed the MS01. Now, the MS01, you know, that has onboard 10 gig, and it's only a little bit more expensive than this. So the price here might be nice if it was a little bit more aggressive. But if it came down to, would you rather have, you know, the 12... 700H or 12900H versus this, I think I would rather have this because it is eight performance cores and 16 threads. Technically, you have more cores that you can work with and theoretically, you should have higher performance from the Intel part, but the reality is you don't, especially on Linux. Now, Proxmox on this works pretty well. You will need the very latest bleeding edge kernel because of the Zen 4 architecture that we're working with here, and especially RDNA. If you're going to use that 780M, you're going to need Linux firmware. You're going to have to jump through some hoops in order to get that to work correctly. And if you're going to do virtualization stuff with that on Proxmox, there's yet more hoops that you'll have to jump through. If you're using an add-in GPU, I suggest disabling the Radeon 780M to avoid uh, kernel oops messages, which you might get if you don't configure the Radeon 780M on this platform, or make sure that your kernel is up to date on Proxmox. This board is every bit as delightful as I hoped that it would be. It is a powerhouse machine. I kind of wish that they had a 16-core variant of this motherboard that was just marginally more expensive. Or alternatively, something that was priced a little more aggressively. Something in the $380 range, maybe that gives up a feature or two. I might have also liked to have seen one or two onboard NICs that were 5 gigabit as opposed to 2.5 gigabit. Maybe a 10 gigabit port would be an optional X550. Of course, you do the M.2 cheat codes, add some 10 gig NICs that way. They're kind of pricey. You can still pick up Intel X550 or even, you know, an, an X810 and add that. Or Mellanox, you know, Connect X4, Connect X5, if you can go fiber optics. Sometimes 25 gig does actually work out really well. The insanely high clock speed here means that things like ZFS and iSCSI and all that is going to run insanely fast from this platform. And the fact that, you know, at the wall, we're pulling max 65 watts at about 7 to 8 watts at idle. It's a very impressive platform. Options for build, 3D printable ITX case. You can take a look at the Silverstone case we've reviewed previously. That would be a good fit. Although, you know, that's kind of a pricey case versus something that's 3D printable. <laughs> we did our own 3D printable cube back here for display controls. That would also make a good case for this, assuming that you didn't need a lot of 3.5 inch storage. There are some pretty interesting cases that are 3D printable um, that will hold, you know, four, six, eight, three and a half inch hard drives. And an eight bay case for this motherboard would work really well with the ninth SATA port going for your operating system drive. And then that leaves all the M.2 free and everything else. There's a lot of things you could build from this motherboard using it as sort of the beginning ingredient. So that's why I thought it was exciting and fun to look at. I mean, heck, you could retro convert an old super micro case that had, you know, ancient Nihilum Xeons. Just swap out this ITX motherboard, make sure it's got adequate cooling. For cooling, I tried a Noctua L9i as well as a no-name $20 cooler off of Amazon. Both worked equally well because this thing just doesn't really get hot. I mean, 54 watts max CTDP, it's fine. I'm one of the level one I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums. If you want to see something else that's, you know, maybe we can build. I just like the idea of having this ancient 200 watt power supply. As long as I don't do go too crazy with add-in peripherals. Yeah, 200 watts gets it done. 200 watts gets it done. <laughs>